Hi everyone, I'm Ken Ogle. I uh, work at Channel 4, like my dad Jack Ogle did, and my brother Kevin Ogle did, and my brother Kelly Ogle did for a little while. We go way back with Channel 4. Dad, of course, first worked at the radio station. Some of my earliest memories of the uh, station were the radio station, actually, that was upstairs back when I was a youngster, I believe, if I remember correctly. I remember going up and seeing uh, some of the disc jockeys because we listened to the radio. We were excited to be able to see the guys that we saw on the radio. Uh, Johnny Dark, who later went by J. Robert Dark. It's dark till noon. I remember his slogan on the air. Uh, some of the other guys, uh, of course, Danny Williams was there and uh, uh, a bunch of the different radio personalities that we thought were, were pretty cool. Pretty cool guys to see them actually up there doing their job. I actually went through the station one time uh, with a tour group with my with my Cub Scouts going through the uh, through the station there, and that was fun to just to wave at Dad as he was uh, in the newsroom uh, doing his job. wasn't out on the story just quite yet, so that would have been oh, I was probably a first grader, mid '60s back in those days. Um, station was considerably smaller. The newsroom was very small at the time. Uh, had a small staff, all men. When my dad first started, by the way, Pam Henry is the first woman to come on board back in the mid 70s. Um, I remember some of the some of the people that dad worked with uh, early on. I remember when Bob Dotson was there as a as a young man. Of course again I was just a kid. He was very kind to me. We went on a fishing trip one time. They were doing a documentary on the Illinois River. Me and my brothers didn't know that. We thought we were going on a fishing trip and that's pretty much what we did. Dad let us tag along and went out with Daryl Barton and and uh, Bob Dotson did that documentary on the Illinois River. They did a lot of documentaries in those days. But that was a real fun trip to get to meet those guys. I kind of got fascinated a little bit with Daryl and his camera. And uh, as I got to be a little bit older, when they were covering the football games, and Daryl was shooting on the sidelines for the highlight shows that were very popular, the run of 71, uh, Prairie Tree, some of those. Uh, I was actually gripping uh, for Daryl uh, back in those days for the highlight shows. And gripping means that you were uh, helping him load his camera and that type of stuff and uh, that was a whole lot of fun for me working with Daryl Barton who of course went on to the networks and has had an amazing career, super talent. I also remember when a young Brad Edwards came on board, I remember he had this big hairdo, he had curly hair and I thought wow who's this young hip guy, I was uh, coming into my teenage years and uh, he was uh, such a talented guy and, uh, and was extremely popular in the newsroom, was very funny. And uh, I had the opportunity later in my life to work with Brad, which was a real honor for me, of course. And my, my dad was a huge fan of Brad's uh, all around. Uh, dad and Bob Barry had quite a camaraderie uh, in the newsroom. Uh, they didn't agree politically, which was kind of funny, but Bob always told me they never had an argument about it, always just had a good time with it. That's what I remember a lot about, a lot of laughing in that newsroom, a lot of joking in that newsroom, even through all the tough things that they had to cover. And of course, Dad and Bob uh, covering the OU and OSU football games together just made a great team. I still have people to this day come up to me and say the best announcing team we ever had at OU or at OSU was uh, your dad and Bob Barry. And so that means a lot for me to hear that. One thing I also remember is when I was a youngster uh, back when the Oklahoma Publishing Company owned uh, WKY as it was then and the radio station. They had a summer party every year. I didn't really even know it at the time. Dad kind of later told me about it. Uh, and I remember it was at one of the amusement parks. It was probably Spring Lake, might have been Wedgwood, I don't know, but it seemed like they rented out the whole place uh, just for Channel 4 and, uh, and the Oklahoman employees and, and things like that. So it was fun to, to see some of the other uh, kids of the employees there, uh, Frank Berry and Bob Berry Jr. And, and that's kind of where we got to know some of those people when we were youngsters. Uh, and so uh, it was real special back then to belong to that whole family uh, thing that was going on with, with Channel 4 at the time. And it's still a family. That's what's nice about the environment at Channel 4 is uh, that part of it's really kind of never changed. When I was a teenager, um, one year my dad got me a summer job at Channel 4. I thought, man, this is going to be fun. I wonder, I want to be going out with the crews. I'm going to be doing all this and that. I wound up painting the file room for the entire summer, uh, yanking cases of film out and painting all the cabinets that were in the file room. I uh, also had to do a little bit of painting on the ceiling and one day I was uh, 
painting a ceiling when I was up on one of the big walkways they use in the studios and I was doing a little bit of painting on a ceiling. And Ronnie Kay came walking right underneath him with his big long hair. He maybe he was heading for a taping of the scene or something. Would have been in the later years of that show. But I remember thinking that was pretty neat and he looked up at me, waved at me and uh, we got to talk and I got to know Ronnie that summer a little bit. That was a fun summer for me, uh, working there at the station and kind of seeing how it was really, uh, what was really going on. A big transition time back then, moving from film into videotape, uh, very early days of microwaving and doing uh, uh, live shots uh, of, of different sorts. They'd always done some, of course, but it took a lot more equipment. Things were rapidly changing then, so that was a fun time to be working that summer there at News Channel 4. It's a summer job I'll never forget. Getting back to when we used to work the football games, of course, Oliver Murray, who was, uh, he was working in the news department there at the time and also kind of was making the transition to production as well. And uh, <laughs> Oliver always found a good way to use those Ogle boys. This was back when the old video packs were just coming in, the, the what we call the, the mini cams, as they were called. It had this huge backpack that weighed like 75 pounds. And uh, the first couple times that I worked the sidelines, I ended up carrying the pack, as Oliver would call it, and he would always tell you too, if you're on the sidelines and the players are coming, you think you're gonna get run over by the players, protect the pack. Oliver didn't care what was gonna happen to you, he wanted you to protect that pack, that was his job. And uh, now I remember inviting some friends to come up and help me work the games a few times, and said, hey, I'll get you a press pass. Boy, by the end of that game, usually if it was a hot game too, and they'd protected the pack the whole game, they knew what Oliver Murray was all about. Yeah. I, Working with Oliver and the guys at the football game uh, was, a, was a whole lot of fun uh, back then. They, they made it fun. It was a long day. I was, like I said, I was gripping with Daryl Barton. And I remember one time uh, we were waiting down at the bottom of the press elevator. My dad, Frank Boggs, a writer from the Oklahoma, and Daryl, or not Daryl, pardon me, uh, Oliver. And Frank Boggs was just talking about, I wonder what they're serving for lunch up in the press box. About that time, the elevator door started to open and here comes Barton, who wasn't known for his neatness. He comes walking out of the elevator and Frank Boggs looked at his shirt and said, we're having chili. Of course, we're all real proud of, uh, proud of the work that dad put in at Channel 4 and, and especially kind of when his career kind of came uh, full circle and he started doing commentaries for the station. Uh, that was kind of a whole new avenue for dad and it, they became uh, very popular very rapidly. In fact, um, a lot of people know Dad did commentaries not only at the station but also on radio and at other television stations in Oklahoma City. So that became a real uh, trademark for Dad, and it's something that uh, that we were proud of uh, as well in Dad's uh, history there. And you know, also at Channel Four, he learned to do so many different things. It was such a time when everybody had to wear so many hats that it enabled Dad later in his life, of course, to follow. Uh, Don Wallace, if you will, in Don Wallace's career, Dad ended up going over to Eastern Oklahoma and worked out of Fort Smith doing a hunting and fishing show. So, you know, Dad was able to, he picked up all those different things from Channel 4 that enabled him to have a real fun career later in his life. So that was a lot of fun for him. And he also went into talk radio after he'd learned uh, to handle some of those types of things from his commentary. So uh, Jack Ogle really benefited from his time at Channel 4 and we're hopeful that Channel 4 benefited from his time as well. My dad always really enjoyed his coverage of the Capitol and uh, was very, uh, very much involved in covering politics and, and become quite friendly with many of the lawmakers. And, uh, and I remember my mother was a senator's secretary back in the time and my grandmother ran the Senate page desk for many, many years. So my brothers and I would often page uh, there at the Capitol of the Senate. And, uh, and I remember seeing dad out of the Capitol really in his element talking with lawmakers as I was running around doing my little page duties and uh, and that was a whole lot of fun to see him interacting with these people that he was covering at the time. Uh, there was so much more political coverage at the time done on a local level and that really gave him access and an understanding of the stories that he was covering every day and the people he's covering and the direction that the state was going back when he was doing all that capital coverage. Well, one thing that's really nice about uh, you know following in dad's footsteps working in the business was he was able to help us when we were uh, first breaking into it and giving us some good ideas. But I always liked about Dad, and this is what people liked about his delivery, I think, was it really came off as he was just speaking to you. And he often told me, uh, remember, you know, if, if you're having trouble telling a story, remember what you would do if you had 15 seconds to pick up a phone and tell your best friend what that story was about. That will give you clarity. That will give you a, a, a sense of urgency. 
And, um, and that was really good advice, and I've thought about that many times before, different types of live shots and things uh, when I was trying to get my thoughts together on exactly what was going to happen. That, of course, came out of radio, and I, I also worked early in radio. I love the urgency of radio. I love the excitement of radio. Uh, and, and I think he got some of that from his dad because his dad worked for Western Union and later worked at AT&T and was actually one of their very fastest telegraph operators. In fact, my granddad did OU football games, actually broadcast them to the U.S. military and service members around the world on telegraph. He would run the telegraph there and he actually had a small little telegraph operation that he put together that uh, he could put online there in the press box in the early days before, uh, before really full-blown radio broadcast that were going out all over the place in order to get it to the service members, they would send it out on telegraph. And that's the way my uh, granddad got started in the business. And I think dad kind of got a little bit of the media bug from there, uh, kind of ran down through us, obviously. And uh, now, of course, to have my niece, Abigail, uh, working in sports is real exciting in sports television. So it all seems to be uh, running smoothly down the, down the lane at this time, but it's fun to look back and see where it all got started. My name is Kevin Ogle, K-E-V-I-N-O-G-L-E. -E. My dad was Jack Ogle. Uh, this is my second tour of duty at News Channel 4. I was there from 1982 to 1986 as a street reporter, then went to Arkansas and did some learn how to anchor over there, then came back as an anchor to Channel 4 in 1993, and I've been there ever since. Distinct thing I remember, the earliest thing I remember, and this is kind of strange, when we would go up to visit Dad at the station for whatever reason was the smell of processing oil or fluid or whatever it was that they processed the film with. I always associate Channel 4 with that smell of film being processed. My earliest recollection there. And then going into that newsroom, that first one that they had that was so little compared to what we have now. Of course, then when you were a kid, it seemed bigger. But, and then going in to see dad uh, in his little office there, whenever we needed money or we needed something when we got a little bit older. And we would go up occasionally to the um, observation booth and watch him do the news. Uh, but when, when they had the old black set, you know, you had dad there in front, you had Jim in front of the weather board and Bob Sr. over here. And they would start out with the, with the wide shot of all three of them uh, illuminated. And then they turned the lights off on Bob and Jim and dad would do his news uh, right there. And then when it was time for the weather, they would turn dad's light off and Jim's light would come on and the same thing for Bob. And I just remember it so well. Uh, remember going to the football games with Bob and Dad. I was the spotter for them uh, several seasons. The first season I did it, I was an eighth grader, and they were doing OU uh, then still, and I uh, got to go to an OU Texas game, and it, it was awesome. And then I did I did some spotting for them when they were at OSU as well. Uh, but uh, they were fun guys to be in between. I can tell you that in the broadcast booth when they were doing those games. Because what you heard on the radio uh, was not anything like what it was when they were off the air because it was a lot of fun and could not be aired, but that was the best stuff. Another thing I remember about Dad was he would bring the old Bell and Hal camera home. This was in the 60s when uh, Kent and Kelly and I were really young and he would shoot video of us opening presents on Christmas morning. And then he would use it that night on the air to show what it was like on Christmas morning for three boys tearing into their presents. And uh, that was a really special time. Uh, Christmas was really cool around the Ogle house uh, while he had the old Bell and Howl around there. But uh, just coming up and uh, watching Dad and get, I'll tell you another thing that was very neat too. They would Christmas carol, the newsroom would go out Christmas caroling every year. People don't do that anymore, but the newsroom used to. This is back in the early 70s when Dad was news director and they would go out Christmas caroling, and the last house the newsroom staff always stopped at was my dad and mother's house because they knew they could find liquid refreshment there. <laughs> and my dad did not disappoint, nor did they. They would come and sing, and they were so good. Even Oliver Murray could sing back then. And then they would come into the house, and they'd visit, and dad would serve cocktails or whatever, and I'd sneak out and look around and see all these people that uh, went on to become famous, like Charlie Hoff, and uh, we had guys like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going blank now, Bob, um, what's the guy's name at NBC? Bob Dotson, uh, uh, Oliver, the first uh, African-American to work in the market, and just all people like that, Pam Henry, um, 
and all these people from way back, like in 71 and 72 at Channel 4, Daryl Barton, who went on to work for 60 minutes and 48 hours. And uh, of course, Charlie Hoff, I mentioned, he went on to work for a CNN for a long time. And uh, so that was really cool to go out there and see all of them because they'd be out there partying when they thought we were back there asleep. But they, those are good memories. Channel 4 is family. I mean, there are people there who have been there forever. Uh, obviously, you got uh, people like the Berries, the Edwards, the Ogles, who have had not only uh, one member work there, but also other members as well, all, all the way down uh, to the youngest. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a family place, it really is. And our new GM, Wes Milburn, sees it as that, which I'm really glad about. He, he understands and appreciates the history of Channel 4. And uh, so that makes it special. Uh, we should have a, a hall of honor up there with all the pictures of all the past that have gone before us. And when I was in eighth grade, I got the spot in the booth for Dad and Bob Barry when they were doing the OU games. And we went to the Texas game that year in Dallas and I got to go, took me out of school. And he showed me a spot there on Commerce Street. It was when Commerce Street was still open and that was the big drag for the OU Texas weekend still. Um, there was a, a hotel there, and Dad told me a story. He said, this is why I don't let you get out and walk around on Commerce Street tonight. Because one time I was doing an interview with a police officer. This was back in the early 60s when he did the interview. And the police officer, we were standing under a hotel. There was no awning. The police officer kept looking up like this, kept going. And finally, my dad said, sir, why do you keep looking up? And he said, well, I don't like standing underneath this hotel this time of night on Commerce Street. You never know what could come down. So they went under the awning and dad said not 10 seconds later, a huge bottle of beer smashed right where they were standing. And uh, he said it could have been them real easy if that police officer had not been as savvy as he was about the OU Texas weekend. Kavanaugh tells me the story because she was there at the time. About the time dad, before the 10 o'clock, uh, had to go to the bathroom. So he took his scripts in there and the scripts fell in the urinal. Back then, you didn't have teleprompters, man. You just went from the scripts that Dad took them, shook them off, and took them out to the set and used them that night. And I think Bob and Jim stayed way away from him that night, too, on their three shots. So, I mean, those are the kind of things you had to do back then. You know, you had to just go with the flow, and that's what Dad did. Another story, too, that's kind of funny, Kavanaugh told me, was one time, um, it's when the Gaylords owned Channel 4, and little Eddie, the youngest, Eddie was uh, had a summer job there, little Eddie Gaylord, and you're supposed to, he was supposed to run the film up to the booth so they could run it during dad's newscast. Well, he got somehow, something happened and he, he didn't get him up there in time, he just forgot, or he was on the phone with a girlfriend or whatever. And so everybody thought, well, and it was a disaster on the show. You know, dad would call for the film, he'd read into it, it wouldn't be there. They'd have to go to something else and it was just a disaster. So everybody's wondering, well, what's, What's Jack going to do when he comes back? What's he going to say to the station owner? He can't say anything to him. And uh, Kavanaugh told me that he came in, Dad came in and sat down in his chair, put tobacco in his pipe, tamped it down and lit it. Little Eddie walked up real sheepishly and all Dad said was, Eddie, we start the show at 6 o'clock every night. That's all you have to remember. A great story about Dad and Bob when they were doing their games is they went to some place. Uh, Maybe it was Notre Dame, maybe it was another kind of place where they're a little, not quite as laid back as they are here in Oklahoma by letting people into the press box. And dad went in with somebody who was on his crew, but they said he didn't have a press pass. And dad said, well, I, he's with me. And they said, nope, he can't come in. So dad looked at the guy, kind of winked and said, okay, you stay out here and we'll meet you after the game. So they go upstairs to the press box. Dad gets on the phone and calls down to whatever remote they were working out of and said whoever this was have him go and stand on somewhere uh, there was a place at the stadium where everybody knew and so dad took his press took his press pass went out there saw the guy down there made a little parachute out of his kerchief tied got some strings tied to it and floated the press pass down to it the guy took it went over to the press elevator and said I found my press pass the guy said okay you're good to go and came on up and that's how they got that's how they got around things back in those days, which I think is is it's pretty inventive and very resourceful too. Um, let's see, let's talk about oh the the battleship again. Dad 
was in the newsroom. Ernie was getting ready to do the noon news. And dad told me that Ernie said, Jack, I've got this script and it's about the battleship Iowa that's coming into port with a lot of troops on it. This is during the Vietnam War. They're coming back from the war. And he said, and I've got it in my mind that I'm going to say the battleship Iowa. Dad said, oh, you're not going to. Ernie, you're too much of a professional. Uh, I've had those same things run through my mind. It's not going to happen. You just go out there and do your show like you always do. And it's going to be perfect like it always is. And Ernie said, no, I've really got this in my head. It's going to happen. Dad said, no, it's not. Don't worry about it. So Ernie went out there and got on the set and promptly said, the battleship, the battleship, the battleship, the Iowa pulled into port today and just went on with the show like nothing had happened. And uh, he did have it in his head and it did come out of his mouth, but I think he handled it pretty well. Now, let me tell you something about um, the real Oklahoman commentary that dad did. He did this commentary called The Real Oklahoma. It was very popular. They, in fact, they mailed out like 75,000 copies of it. People liked it so much. And then da after dad passed away, um, Tony Stizza, our chief photographer said, hey, I have an idea. Let's use your dad's commentary, but I'll cut you and Kent out reading part of it with it. A real Oklahoman is one who knows the greatest horse race in history ended in Guthrie and not at Churchill Downs. A real Oklahoman can survive, survive the rigors, the rigors of, today. of today because they know the dreams for tomorrow can be reached. They see it happening all around them. A real Oklahoman knows the state was settled by opportunists, outlaws, and ne'er-do-wells. But realize it was developed by realists and scholars and workers. A real Oklahoman knows that Sooners started out as the bad guys. They marvel, they marvel the at the that fact there are that there are those living. living that have watched this state from its beginning. A real Oklahoman thinks Veal Oscar is the guy that takes care of the calves at the feedlot and that manual labor is an illegal immigrant. Oklahomans change what they can and refuse to believe there isn't anything that can't be made better, even Texans. They believe you need an airplane to get high and rocks to get stoned. When you ask where they're coming from, they'll name a county, not a philosophy. A real Oklahoman knows the Gettysburg Address is not 220 Northwest 5th. They have respect for the past, effort for the present, and unbounded dreams for the future. They recognize the challenges before them. They see the rewards for success, and they dare you to become a part of it. A real Oklahoman thinks Will Rogers was the father of our country, the Civil War takes a back seat to the run of 89, and that heaven will have short grass, blackjack trees, and quarter horses. A real Oklahoman knows the Orange Bowl is for fun, the Cotton Bowl for Texans, and the Dust Bowl was God's warning. They think success is overcoming a third and long at Nebraska. They believe in God, family, the self-propelled combine, and a drill bit. But most of all, they believe in themselves. Real Oklahomans will tell you if you think the first 100 years were something. Just stick around, partner. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. This is Jack Ogle. And he did such a magnificent job on it that uh, it went on to win uh, an Emmy Award. Not for anything Kent and I did, because Dad wrote it and we just copied what he read and Tony uh, wove it in and out of Dad's commentary, but it was really special. It's something I cherish, being connected to my dad that way. And I do have a story on Bob Berry Jr. When I got married in 1984, Bob Berry Jr. and Jerry Adams were in charge of my bachelor's party. And let me just tell you, that is a pair to draw to when they're planning a bachelor's party. So they got it in their head. They were going to use the Channel 4 double-decker bus that Lee Allen brought over from England. It's like a moving billboard going down the street. This double-decker English bus with Channel 4, I was at KTBY all over. It was called KTBY at the time. So we went out and, uh, you know, the bachelor's party was wild. Uh, we were running up and down the streets, going to different places, and uh, other things happened um, that shouldn't have. And we pull back in, everybody goes home. I come back in <clears throat> after my, well, we did it on the weekend, and I got married a week later. So on the Monday after my bachelor's party, I still had to go to work. I came back in, Bob Berry Jr. met me on the back porch. I said, Ogle, 
you have got to go upstairs right now and lie to Lee Allen for me. <laughs> because if you don't, I won't be working here for another hour. Because somebody had called in and said, hey, I saw that double-decker bus of yours going down the street, guys hanging out of it, drinking beer, throwing things, and all this kind of stuff. So, Junior, I had your back, and you're still with me all these years later. Okay, now, uh, the, the lesson Dad gave me about doing television news, he said, because Dad wasn't Jack Ogilvie, he was just Jack. He was just, uh, you know, your friend telling you the news. He said, always be yourself. There is not another Jack Ogle, there is not another Kevin Ogle, there's not another John Spence, there's not another Bob Barry. You are unique, you are unique in your own way. And be that way on TV, and people will relate to you, which I think was great advice.